When it was as I was reading uh, Pawan Kumar's blog, Making Enemies, that I came across this heart-stopping sentence. The old will be scared and insecure and they will die soon. <laughs> and I realized that that shock of recognition that strikes most true when you are most unprepared. Hang on, that's me he's talking about. <laughs> And so I decided that before I realized the full intensity of that prophecy by actually popping it, I should share some leanings from my scared and insecure career. But well, to start at the beginning, it wasn't always like this. I remember being young once, very long ago, and being motivated by the same enthusiasm and hope that this audience has now and should never lose. I came from a film background, not just any common garden variety film background, but perhaps the best that a young kid could hope to fly. My grand uncle was the film director Shuktajit Rai, and growing up in the presence of that extraordinary man, and in an environment that threw up a panoply of film guards, I knew immediately that I was a devotee, and that my religion flickered at 24 frames a second. I have since met too many interns, too many colleagues, too many assistants who have neither gods nor religion. For them, film is a job. Of course it's a job, but that's not all it is. Today I'm disturbed to see success calculated in shifts and in the number of shooting days accumulated this month. And I can in no way associate that feeling with the one that I grew up with. And so I say to you, and this is the first learning I acquired as I began my fascination for film, I say to you, if you wish to worship in the temple of cinema, go seek out your gods. What does that mean, seek out your gods? It means realizing T.S. Eliot's idea that we may know more than the past, but the past is what we know. It means realizing that you stand on the shoulders of giants. It implies the act of not just watching, but of darshan, looking deeply at how a great artist interprets the world he or she inhabits. In my own genuflection to Ra, I discovered a tenet that has remained the cornerstone of my very limited, humble offerings in that temple, humanism. He taught by shining example the ability to engage with the inner life of a character, rather than the impersonation of one. And that is something I would recommend to any filmmaker. It goes beyond the crafting of clever dialogue or intricate camera movement, or expert cutting, which is not to deride any of those things. But it comes instead from observation and from empathy. Not just often with the person, but equally importantly, I think, observation of and empathy with context. And so I urge you, because I myself have slipped too often into that valley, that when you next sit down to script, or when you next direct actors, do not be entrapped by how cleverly, how cleverly the dialogue speaks or how the camera swoops from the establishing shot to the detail or how magically the dream mat will be replaced. But consider how true you are to the inner life of your character and to his or her particular context. And if you want a quick lesson in what this means, Simply revisit the opening scene of Chandrata and you will know immediately how empathetic observation of character in context can resonate beyond the particular and become universal. Or go to something quite at the other extreme, Apocalypse Now, and see how the arrogance of America is distilled into the strut of Robert Duval on a Vietnamese beach and how much criticism of U.S. foreign policy is contracted into that one memorable line. 
I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Which brings me to my second, seemingly contradictory learning. Having found your gods, run away from them. Why do I say this? Precisely because Rai was a brilliant man. He could draw, write, score music, design sets and costumes, and he also operated camera and directed. At the impressionable age of 12, I thought it was all great fun. And hey, it was easy. I've spent a lifetime discovering it is not. By the time I graduated, I was beginning to see the truth of my situation. And it was this. I was drawn to telling stories. And I believed that film was my medium. But if I stayed in the shelter of that great banyan tree that was shook to the dry, I would be stunted forever. I needed my own piece of sun, and at the age of 21, I ran away from all that had nurtured me to Bombay and to advertising. So, having found your gods, run away from them. When you are starting out, you need to have role models, I think. You need to be part of a tradition that is bigger than you, but one that essentially informs you and your own development as an artist. You need to test different voices before settling on your own. But then as you begin to discover your own soul, you must break away. This step is perhaps the most difficult. Too early and you could remain unformed, unprepared. Too late and you could be doomed to repeating by rote. You can see the dangers of this most clearly in our classical musicians and singers. I refer, of course, to those who grew up in the Guru Shishya Parampara. It is a way of life that is moving towards extinction, and yet I believe the benefits of that model to be immense, and I wish we had it in our cinema more. I believe in that idea enough to introduce it into the running of my own company. And today in Bombay, there are at least a dozen successful filmmakers and producers who have profited by that grooming. And each one of them has found his own voice and intention. But I have gone ahead of myself. I started a company to make commercials when I was in my early 20s. And I think going to the fact that in those years there were perhaps a dozen of us who were in any serious competition, I made a place for myself pretty quickly in the big, not so bad world of advertising. But when I think about why I managed to make a rather protracted career out of advertising films, I believe I did three things that you might find useful. One, I practiced my craft and learned from my mistakes. Two, I had people around me that I respected. And three, I was not frightened to lose business. What does this mean to young filmmakers such as yourselves? One, practicing craft. Or to go back to my musical analogy, Riaz. I cannot stress enough the importance of this. I was lucky to be able to do that because for about five intense years, I was making two or three films a month. In those days, that was a big thing. Everything about film before digital was expensive, both the shooting and the post, and some of it was arcane knowledge and the preserve of a few who knew, like 35 millimeter cinematography, where you didn't know whether things had been exposed correct on what you shot until two days later. But today, with the accessibility of digital cameras and cheap editing systems, you can practice your craft more readily. And you should grab every opportunity to do so, regardless of the stage you are given to tell your stories. Make virals, make wedding videos, do advertising promos, music videos, short films, anything. Some of these will be execrable, as so many of my own ad films were, but you will gain something that is invaluable at this stage of your career. You will get to hone your craft. But remember, you still won't find that true voice 
unless you are brilliantly self-critical and unless you embrace my second point, which is this. Surround yourself with talent you respect. And when I say talent, I don't mean just writers and technicians. I mean production talent as well. Young filmmakers don't realize how critical a good producer is to the making of films. Very often, she is the difference between success and the dream that became a nightmare. We have an excellent representative on the panel today, Ruchi Bhimani. I don't think it is a coincidence that she shepherded both Kaikoche and that astonishing work, Ship of Thesis. More than any other medium, it is the talent you associate with that helps you grow. These are the people who will criticize and contribute. It is an axiom that film is a collaborative medium, and yet I see too few well-knit teams. Why is this? Because trust is earned over time. And too, many, and too many players in the team suffer from self-deception about their individual worth. one upmanship rings the death knell of both creative work and the human spirit. So cherish the creativity of your compatriots. But a word of caution, shy away from the mediocre. I haven't always succeeded myself, for it is a tightrope that we walk in film between arrogance and humility. What do you stand by? What do you give up? Each of you will have to find your own answer, but none can duck the question. It will define your work. The answer will define your work, and by extension, your life. Three. I was not frightened to lose business. In a world of commerce and sometimes easy morality, this was a difficult principle to uphold. The world of advertising today, and indeed of films, is so competitive, so demanding, that abiding by one's convictions, not arrogance, <coughs> convictions, there is a difference, is very difficult. And yet as filmmakers, our convictions are what define how we play our very own game of thrones. In my books, persistence of vision is not just the basis of cinema, it is the bedrock of a filmmaker's life. And yet, ironically, it is the very first thing we compromise in the need to make work. Before I speak of my third learning from the fringes where I have lived, let me digress and mention two regrets. The lack of deep roots. Even though I came from a very culturally aware family, I grew up without any deep roots in the literature and the mythology of my country. My upbringing was very Western. For example, I learned Western classical piano badly and had no grounding in any musical tradition or for that matter, in what should have been the most natural music of all, given my background, Robin Roshonit. Besides, we were Brahmos and not at all religious. My association with Hinduism was restricted to what I gleaned from the annual puja at my neighbors. But these were events that were more convivial than educational or spiritual. Later, I made a conscious effort to be more connected to my own culture. I have spent a lifetime listening to Hindustani classical music. I have brushed up on my mythological texts. I even learned to read and write Urdu. But it was too little, too late. I realized this lack with particular sharpness while making my recent documentary on Bharatanatyam. There was so much that was superficially familiar, and yet, not an essential part of my life. I had information, but I was not informed. You must cherish and celebrate and constantly renew your roots, and that includes an essential engagement with Indian language. Pavan, I'm sure, will tell you more. 
Most of the talented Indian filmmakers I have met, or whose work I have seen and respected, have this in common. They have very deep roots and are habitually bilingual. You cannot do without English in today's world, but the sap of your creativity will be in your own soil. Nurture it. Speak your language. The second regret is something physiological, and I don't know how to circumvent it. It is that I forget easily. Memory, as much as imagination, is what allows us to make better films. I am now regarding the idea of memory as separate from the idea of roots. Memory is the smell of earth after a kalbu shakti. Memory is the taste of tea from a bhaan at a railway station. Memory is the peremptory ting ting of a tram. Memory is roadside wrestlers slapping their haunches. Memory is not just not forgetting. It is feeling made all the richer in recollection. So if like me you tend to forget easily, do something about it. Make notes, keep video diaries or written ones. Caption your Instagrams and store them for remembering. Don't just Facebook them for forgetting. And one more thing. Memory is the basis of structure. You can tell complex stories when you remember and then connect. You can have deep structure only when you remember well. I have of course referred to a certain kind of film in this talk, one where the director has something to say about the world in which he lives. This is film as argument or as investigation or sometimes as essay. There are, of course, many other kinds of films, and I dare say I have spent many hours of, to use a good Bombay phrase, time pass in the cinema. But I have no idea how to go about the job, and no interest in telling you how, even if I knew. So after such knowledge, what happened? Why in a career spent mainly in and around the craft of film, have I only two documentaries to show for it? Well, that leads me to my third learning. Get out of your comfort zone. As I mentioned, I was very successful early on in the game. But a career in advertising films is a very consuming process where you are judged every fortnight. And I discovered quite quickly that with clients, the evil you do lives after you, the good is often turned with your bones. But I got lucky. I was well rewarded both in terms of money and the respect of my peers. And so I found comfort in what I knew I did well. And that I discovered too late is hugely dangerous. When you start getting comfortable, you should begin to worry. The greatest comfort in filmmaking is the sequel. Imagine a world made up of krishas and dhooms stretching to an infinity of numbers. In a sense, that is what became of my own advertising career. I was no longer young. There were a bunch of very good, very motivated filmmakers, people like you, snapping at my heels. And I had nourished a ravenous company that needed constant feeding. So what started as a challenge, became a joy, turned into a grind. I could see the wave coming and I thought I would ride it. Instead I drowned. So learn from my mistake. Get out of your comfort zone before you are trapped in it. Challenge yourself in what you do and how you do it. Dare to fail. Just don't make a habit of it. I have taken my own advice. I retired from the company I started. I have no employees. I operate from a small room. And I recently made a film on a subject, Bharatanatyam, about which I knew nothing. I researched the film, I wrote it, I narrated it, I edited it, I produced it, and I directed it. 
In a way, it was my escape from the comfort zone of advertising. Today, I am once again alive. I am young. I am you. Thank you.